Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's um, session. My name is, is Sebastian Bailey. Um, I'm a psychologist by background and training, and my, my particular speciality is learning transfer. My PhD focused on, on how do you actually make learning and change stick. So over the next 30 minutes or so, um, I'm going to introduce some different ideas about um, how you can make learning stick and, and the bite-sized approach to learning that's been drawn from the academic evidence that is drawn from um, practice with over a million participants and 1,500 organizations um, around the world. So thank you all so much for, for joining today. We're in the WebEx environment. If you do have any questions, do please um, pop them into the chat box at the right-hand side um, of the screen. There's a, a chat um, area. There's also a, a Q&A area. If you're having any technical difficulties, ble uh, please do um, uh, focus your, your questions at MindGym host and then, and then MindGym's team will be able to um, answer any of those specific questions. So let's have a look at what we're going to, what we're going to cover over the next um, 30 minutes. Initially, we're going to, I'd like to tell you a story about what seems to, to, to work and what do we mean by the bite-sized methodology and the bite-sized revolution. We're then going to have a look at some of the blocks and releases to bite-sized. So um, what stops people? What makes it hard for organizations to adopt a bite-sized approach? And what do we think the ways are in which they can overcome that? We're then going to briefly look at the bites in bite size. What do we mean by that? And then finally, in practice, what is the evidence that this actually works? And the way I'd like to introduce this, despite the fact that we, mind you, um, focuses our attention specifically on organizations, is actually tell you a story that's not about organizations, but is actually about, um, in many respects, the most important learning job that I have and that many of you will have, and that is parenting. And um, a few years ago, we were approached by um, an individual who runs a charity with underprivileged um, children who are effectively on in, in deprived areas of, of London. And these kids are effectively on a career path towards um, prison and jail and um, arguably a long-term life of, of crime. So what, what he was saying was that these individuals are essentially on, a, um, on the career path towards um, uh, jail and, and a life of crime, and he was able to change it. But he was saying, we're actually getting to people too late, and is there a way in which you can help us to um, uh, solve these problems earlier? And actually, that really starts with the parenting. And so what I'd like to introduce you to is actually something that, that Mind Gym does as part of our corporate social responsibility, and that is Parent Gym. And what was very interesting about this was that, was that first of all, the challenges were, were significant because we're trying to change a really entrenched um, and quite a sensitive behavior. People don't like really being told what to do in terms of the way in which they parent. Um, also, because it was totally voluntary, if they didn't like it, they wouldn't come back. So it had to be a truly engaging experience for people. It was also, though, filled with opportunity because we believed we'd be able to design something that had to work. It had to have significant impact. It really mattered. And so, so we had an opportunity to almost unfetter ourselves from constraints and really think about what we could produce that could have a really significant impact. And this is what we made. So initially, um, we created effectively 90-minute sessions around particular topics that we researched from the literature, so from the parenting literature, from the educational psychology literature, and also from interviews with, with parents who seem to succeed in these really deprived parts of, of, of the city. Um, so we developed these 90-minute sessions, and effectively what, what, what each one does would focus on a particular topic, and this one, for example, focuses on chat or having uh, great conversations with your children, and that would then be followed by what we call a, a pledge. So it was a specific commitment to a particular series of actions that were based upon the content that was covered in this magazine. And we designed the magazines to feel like they had value. It was a cross between um, OK Magazine or Take a Break or Us Weekly, for example. We even put the price on it so that it had a sense of intrinsic value to the participants. What we then did is, is create what we called a mission. And this is essentially a transfer task. It might be, for example, um, asking people to create a reward chart to work with their children on. So it was a very, very specific transfer task that we would encourage people to connect with. This was then followed up with a booster. And the booster was 
very much like an after action review. It was a particular um, conversation that focused people on have you been successful? Have you managed to make a change? How much effort have you put in? And has, has you, have you successfully been able to, to um, implement and make these changes? And what we would do is we would say, um, score yourselves on a scale from zero to 10 in terms of the amount of effort that you've made in the particular mission. And then if you scored over seven, let's have a conversation about what you did and, and, and how you were successful. And it made a really um, rich conversation around both where people had succeeded to transfer their learning and also those instances where they'd been less successful, which were just as interesting. Now, what we then did was we then distributed these experiences over a period of time. So there was one on chat, there was the next one on rules, there's one on how you help your children learn, and one on how you start to express love. And this would go on over a period of about seven weeks. So it was bite-sized, distributed learning that was really focused on the intervention and focused on transfer. So did it work? That was ultimately the, the question, and the proof is in the pudding. And I'm delighted to say it really did. Um, this was independently measured uh, using scales that have been well validated in the parenting and also in the child development literature. And we found that pro-social behavior increased, peer problems dropped, hyperactivity amongst obviously the children dropped, conduct for problems for the children dropped, and um, emotional symptoms or challenging emotional symptoms also dropped off as well. So we had some really significant positive sustained changes three to five months after the program. And we also had some great qualitative um, results like people talking about how they'd actually stopped smacking their children, how there was lost less, significantly less conflict in the household. So um, we were delighted to see this bite-sized methodology really work with some quite challenging situations and quite entrenched behavior. And we've also had significant successes with organizations. But the question is, um, why don't organizations seem to adopt bite-sized? What stops um, the bite-sized methodology from um, becoming the norm. And we think that there are four key reasons why we don't. And this is from the research that we've done. The first one is that there is a sense that, um, that longer interventions equals a better intervention. Um, it took me seven years to earn my PhD, and therefore those are seven really valuable years that were well spent. Um, another one is that the event becomes the hero. So we focus in the um, interventions that we create, we make the event the hero of the intervention. Another one is the fact that we design for the outlier um, in terms of the people who are actually we're trying to shift the behavior of. And finally, we say that people are different, but actually we treat them all the same. So there are four reasons why it seems difficult to make the shift. And I'd like to explore these reasons a little bit and make a case about why I think we should, as learning and development professionals and practitioners, start to attempt to, to make that, that shift. So the first thing is, is in terms of the longer equals better. Is, that, is the sense of miniaturization. And this was actually a piece of work that we did with the, the BBC, and the BBC independently evaluated this. And what they did was they measured one of our 90-minute workouts, which really tries to concentrate a topic, and, and this particular topic was influence and persuasion. And then um, they, met, they compared it against the day-long intervention that they were running. And these were the results that we, we discovered, the fact that actually the 90-minute workout outperformed the day-long intervention on influencing in terms of knowledge acquisition, in terms of understanding, and also in terms of the ability to adopt different influencing styles to suit other styles or different situations. And these were all measured as standardized shifts, and they were all measured around about a month to six weeks after the invention um, took place. So, that's, that's, so that was great to see, the fact that actually this miniaturization could deliver as much, if not more, value than a day's worth of, of, of learning on influence and persuasion. We then measured it, interestingly, against a two-day intervention. And this is what we found. The two-day outperformed both the day-long and the 90-minute workout on the knowledge on understanding. But very interestingly, it actually performed less well in terms of the ability to adopt the different influencing styles. And I was surprised by this. And we went and, and had a look and, and tried to discover what it was. And what we found was, was that in many instances, the people who'd actually attended the longer program, the two-day program, had become overconfident in terms of their ability to, to adopt the different styles and try them out. And then when they did try them out, and they didn't quite work as well as they were expecting to, um, they then fell back very quickly onto their old habits. So the overconfidence, in some respects, actually worked against them rather than worked for them. And that's why we saw a smaller standardized shift. 
So that sort of makes the case, and from an evidence-based perspective, that, that you can concentrate the learning into shorter bursts and have as much value as a, as a day. Where I think this gets even more interesting in terms of bite-sized methodology is when you add distribution to it. And um, the, I suppose that the, the easy analogy here is which is going to get you fitter faster. Will it be the week in the health farm or regularly visiting the gym twice a week for 30 minutes? And I think that we all intuitively know that the, that's the right thing. And as a friend of mine once said, it works in practice, but does this work in theory? And actually, um, two psychologists called Donovan and Radesevich looked at the impact of distributing learning in performance improvement. So does having little but often actually make a difference to the way in which people perform? And this is what they found. They found that you get a normal distribution curve with massed practice. So um, when mass practice is basically doing it in one clump, it's doing the learning all together at one time. And what they found was, was that you get some people who perform very high, very well, there's a very significant uh, performance improvement. There's some who probably shouldn't be there at all. And then there um, are some in the middle, there's a sort of an average number who do have an average amount of performance improvement. They then did it in this meta-analysis. They then looked at so it's a big study looking at lots of other studies. They said, well, what happens if you use space practice, if you distribute the learning over time? And this is actually what they found. They found that with space practice, you see a half a standard deviation over the mean of improved performance. So everybody who's underneath in that sort of shaded area, which is around, accounts for about 17% of the population, see an increase in, in performance which is great. So it, it works in practice. It seems to work in theory. Is there an economic case for this? Is there an economic case? Is it actually worth making the change? So what we've put together here is an illustrative value proposal. It's, it's an example of um, what we think the value could be. And what you can see here is a traditional approach, which is sort of one day's worth of learning, and then a bite-sized approach, which is two 90 minutes worth, a 30-minute transfer task that focuses very specifically on application, and then a booster session, which is like an after-action review, which focuses on, on, accountability, on driving accountability and, and having people share how they've actually got on in terms of the learning. So the first thing we need to imagine in terms of the cost is the most significant cost is that of the participant's time. And what I've used here is, is imagine 20 manager participants, and I've used the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, average managerial occupations wage, and what you discover is that a day's worth for 20 participants costs round about $9,000, and a bite-size approach is round about $4,500. So it's, it's significantly less expensive. What we can then say is, well, there's facilitator and trainer costs, and there's some travel expenses, and we've used some numbers here that we think are sort of typical of the different approaches. Now, what you find then is that the traditional approach is round about $15,000, whereas the bite-size approach is round about 10 and a half in terms of total costs. The question then is, well, what's the benefit? Now, what we're saying is that the improvement in performance, let's say you get a 5% improvement in performance from a traditional approach. What you'd get from a bite-size approach, given the fact that we believe you get that 17% uplift because you've distributed it. And we've also said that the bite-size approach has as much value as, as the day-long approach. So we've been quite tough on the bite-size approach here. We deliver around about a 6% improvement in performance. Now, what that then equates to, if you do a, something called utility analysis, which is what the, um, sometimes the, the psychologists or the economists use to measure, to monetize um, human capital. So what you do is you essentially take someone's salary and then you multiply it by the shift in performance. You see $107,000 improvement for the traditional approach and around about $129,000 improvement for the bite size approach. Now, when you look at the ROI of this, you see that you get, you still get a really, you know, it's a positive ROI for the traditional approach of around about 620%. But the bite size approach actually gives you double the ROI. It gives you over a 1,000% ROI. Now, as I said, this is illustrative, but it does hopefully make the strong case for the fact that, that longer doesn't actually equal better and that miniaturization and distribution yields some very, very significant benefits. And the bottom line is, is that miniaturization pays. We see a 17% performance improvement. It's 33% cheaper and we get a 200%, therefore, greater return on investment over more traditional approaches, which is, which is um, very, very significant, obviously. So that hopefully dispels the longer equals better reason. The next reason 
of the difficult adoption is the fact that people believe the event is the, the hero. And um, I, this, this um, is, a, I think this is pervasive in the way in which people sort of conduct uh, their, their practice. And we've got a question for you over here, a polling question. And the question is, what percentage of people um, go on to make a sustained change to their behavior after the average learning intervention? So on the right-hand side, if you could just um, click on, and if we could start the poll, please, Lou. Um, if you could click on the number that you believe to be the correct answer. So what do you think is, what are the percentage of people who go on to make a sustained change to their behavior after the average learning intervention? And then we'll be able to have a look at this and get a sense for your answers. And, and this was actually a question that Robert Brinkerhoff, who's a psychologist who specializes in learning, was asked to investigate off the back of um, some work that he did with uh, the World Bank. And um, he, was, he was very interested in what percentage of people go on to make a, a sustained change. And then given that, what's the reason for failure for those changes? So Lou, if we're able to, to publish those results, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Um, and of course, this is a question that lies at the very heart of our professional practice about what um, the, the percentage of people do actually go on to make that change. Thank you very much, Lou. So hopefully, everybody can, can see the results. And the majority of people are saying, oh, sorry, the answer with the greatest number of responses is the 20% mark. So 29% of the people on this call um, suggested that it was 20% of people. 23% uh, of the people on the call suggest that it's 10% of people, and around about 26% suggest that it was 30% um, of people going to make sustained change. And actually, we're all, all of us, very smart group, we're all in roughly the right place. It was at, what Brinkhoff found was that it was around about 15% um, of people, so exactly between the, 20, the 10 to 20% of people go to make a sustained change to behavior which is fascinating when you think about um, the effort that, um, that we go into to do what we do. What he was then interested in was, well, well where does the, the failure occur? And he broke it down into three stages. There's a context setting stage, a learning event stage, and an on-the-job application stage. And what he found was, was that 40% of the failures in learning are as a result of poor context setting up front. So we don't get the context setting right for the learner. Less than 20% of the time, the failure is as a result of a poor design of the learning event. And more than 40% of the time, typically, it is as a result of a poor tuning of the work environment, a poor focus on the job application. And actually, the thing about this study is that really we have an immense amount of unrealized value. 15 or so percent of people um, make a successful sustained change, 70% or so actually try it out and then fall back onto old poor habits, and 15% probably shouldn't be in the room at all. So, so clearly there's, we need to get better at thinking about both the context setting and the on-the-job application of what we do. But I have a bit of an issue with this model, and the issue I have with this model is that it places the learning event at the very center of what we do. And instead, I think we should reduce the sense of the event being the hero and instead make transfer the hero. And the way in which we do that is we change our language and we change the way in which we think about the design of bite-sized interventions or interventions more broadly. And actually, we think about three stages. The first stage is about the way in which we engage and actually about creating learner engagement. The second is about how we support learners to participate and deepen their participation. And this actually allows for informal learning. It allows for semi-formal learning. It's a model that allows for coaching. And then the final thing we have to do is support individuals in, their act, in the activation of their prior learning. And so we need to trigger activation. We need to supplant some of the old habits and, and ensure that the positive new habits are activated at the right moment. Now, the other thing is, is I think that we should think about this as a cycle as opposed to a linear series. And this is particularly important when we think about uh, the bite-sized methodology, because what it allows us to do, because we use distribution, is have many bites of the cherry. So you might not manage to engage all the particip participants up front, but through better participation and through triggering activation, you slowly start to engage more and more of the group until you've actually connected with, with greater numbers of people. And actually, 
Brinkhoff talks about three different types of, of, of learner that we need to, to consider. The type A learner is when you ask them, well, you know, why are you here? They say, well, because it's Wednesday and my manager said that I, I needed to. You get type B learners who say they express a particular interest on a, on a skill. Well, so I want to learn how to influence so that I can persuade my husband and my kids. But then you also get the Yoda-like type C learner who actually says, well, I'm here because I recognize the, the role that I have and how this particular skill and this particular learning can both support the businesses or the organization's development as well as my own development. And really, we get greatest value from those type C participants, but they're also the ones who are least prevalent in our um, organizations and the interventions that we run. So we really need to, to use this engage, participate, and activate model to create more type C learners. And actually, the bite-sized methodology and the bite-sized approach is one of the things that really helps us to, to do that. The next issue, the next block, is, is we design for the outlier. And I think that for those of us on the call who, who, who design interventions, who are instructional designers, will recognize these three different outliers that, that we hear in the back of our heads as we think about the designs. The first is the slow poke, if you're on the um, American side of the Atlantic, and the slow coach, if you're on the European side. And that's where we design for basically the slowest learner in the room and the meeting moves at the slowest mind in the room, and all but one participant will be bored, and all but one mind is underused. Now, what we're not suggesting here is that you need to design to leave people behind, but what we are suggesting is that we can actually lift the pace of, of the instructional design, and by lifting the pace, we also actually lift the, the ability and the attention of the individuals. The second is the skeptic where we, and that's a picture of James Randi, who is a famous skeptic, and the skeptic basically wants us to plow in facts and detail, and what we end up with is actually very, very bloated experiences with every single edge case, a load of unnecessary content, and people start to suffer from training gout. You know, they, they end up feeling heavy and weighed down by the amount of the content and the amount of learning. And actually, we need to be much more focused. And then the final is the dialogue junkie. And the dialogue junkie it wants everything to be collaborative, facilitative, every conversation to be explored. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for the designs that go this way. And, and when, when we're working with our clients, we see designs that are, you know, with every edge case or, or designed specifically around a huge amount of dialogue. The issue is we need to make the shift, and the bite-sized methodology allows us to do this, to really design and focus on application. And so when we're designing for application, there are a couple of things that we need to, to think about. And this is um, referencing some work by a psychologist called David Perkins, who's at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard. And he describes two things. The first one is tools and techniques to actually hug the context. For me, the example here is a little bit like driving. Um, I, I spent most of my time as I was learning to drive, actually in a car, attempting to drive. And that's a classic instance of actually hugging the particular context. And there are a whole series of, of, of design techniques that we can use that effectively hug the context. Simulations, role plays, case studies, problem-based learning, for example, online forums if we're using um, uh, social uh, learning techniques. There are a whole series of, of things that we can do so that actually we're focused on helping, a problem, uh, helping an individual solve a problem in the real world as opposed to helping people learn. And the point here, and this was said to me by um, uh, an individual who runs um, an investment bank's global university, he said that for those interventions that have the most power, they are ruthlessly pragmatic in their design. And they really sort of, they get as close to the context of application as possible and delve into that and deepen in that, and that's where you get the greatest levels of transfer. So designing for application, we've got to hug the context. Now what's interesting about a lot of those um, design principles is that they work well in the context that you're operating in, but they don't work very well in terms of shifting to other contexts. So for example, you can hug the context where if you're learning a skill like feedback um, around providing feedback to um, a direct report. But unless you also learn some of the other contexts, then you may not be very good at giving feedback to, for example, um, your manager or, your, or another leader in the organization or a peer. And that is where this technique of bridging comes in, which is Perkins' other technique. And the idea of bridging is that you, you learn within one context, but then you build bridges to the other context of application, which further deepen your learning. And so um, sorts of techniques that you can use 
is exploring general principles, using multiple illustrations, seeking um, multiple contexts for application, because then learners can start to identify where they can actually make a really big difference. And then the final one is storytelling and, and metaphor. So using stories, using metaphors to really um, uh, connect with the broader principles that, that start to work for people. And there's lots of evidence from the last two slides that if we actually design to hug and design to bridge context appropriately, then we actually drive much, much higher levels of transfer and much higher levels of application. The final aspect that I wanted to touch on was, was you know, we've talked about the engage, we've talked about the participate, now the activate piece. And there are a number of different well-validated and evidence-based approaches to really trigger that prior learning, to, to, to trigger the activation. And the first one is actually making the transfer problem explicit, having people have the conversation about why it's going to be difficult to transfer and what the typical failure rate is. We can also incorporate transfer tasks into the workflow. We can use management observation and, and coaching so that the learning is socialized and scaffolded. And then finally, we can use after action reviews, which is what we demonstrated with Parent Gym earlier on, which again really helps to um, make the connection with, with uh, accountability and support uh, the environment so that people can have a conversation about what was easy, what was difficult, and try again. The next block, which I wanted to touch on, was the fact that often in business, we recognize that everybody is different, but we do treat people all the same. So with issues around be wanting to scale our offer and with issues around wanting to operationally manage it effectively, what we do is we effectively create cookie cutter interventions. And what that does is it actually drops the level of engagement for the participants because they no longer feel unique. They no longer feel that it's individual um, for them. And I think the way, where to, we need to, to look at how we can connect with better interventions that excite people more is actually business to consumer marketing. And I've got an example here of, of, of Starbucks who use mass customization really intelligently to create standardized, scalable, but unique experiences for individuals. And this is my wife's crazy coffee order, the, the tall soya latte and then kids temperature at the end, which always um, gets me when I have to order it. But the idea is, is that this then actually makes it feel quite unique and quite special to her, which then builds her level of engagement. And I think there's an awful lot that we as learning and development professionals can learn from business to consumer marketing techniques in the way in which we start to engage our participants. And the way in which we can do that is actually through mass customization. So we can create learning experiences where particular individuals then have a different number of, they can take different routes through the learning so it's specific to them. So for example, if I'm fantastic at providing feedback but terrible at delegation, then there's no need for me to go to the feedback session at all. It's actually a waste of my time and a waste of the business's money. But the dele delegation session is absolutely relevant to me. And likewise, there may be a colleague who's the exact opposite or reverse of me, and they would have a different journey. Now, the thing about this, and I think this is sometimes what happens with learning management systems, is that the whole catalog is displayed to people, and then they're left to make a choice. And I think that this actually creates almost like a bad buffet effect, where the lasagna and the dim sum and the beef wellington and the glass noodles are all together. And because I like all four of those things, I put all four of them on my plate and I end up having a very dissatisfying experience. It's not a tasty meal because I've mixed badly. And this is where you can use diagnostics, and the Mind Gym has a diagnostic, that actually allows for the intelligent scheduling and the intelligent choice so that you can mass customize the learning for specific individuals. So that basically gives us a sense of the traditional approach versus the bite-sized approach. And what we're saying when we talk about the bite-sized methodology is encouraging people to think about the miniaturization and the distribution, designing specifically for the context of application, really thinking about how you can create engagement, deepen participation, and then trigger activation, making transfer the hero rather than the event, and then finally the mass customization of experiences to build relevance, to build engagement, and to enhance transfer. Um, from a business-related perspective, I just wanted to share one instance, and this was a, 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 some work that we did with Santander. Um, Santander had uh, scored bottom of the customer service leak table, and clearly they wanted to turn that around. And you can see this is their FRS overall score, and the trend was, was very clearly on its way down. We then launched a distributed, miniaturized, and scalable 
customer service program around about September 11. And of course, it takes a little bit of, what, uh, of, of time to, to turn the ship, to start to make some of those changes take place. But then I was delighted to say that at that point, their customer service score started to increase really very significantly. And since then, I'm delighted to say that they've also won a number of awards around the quality of their, of their customer service. So we know it works in theory, we know it works in practice. So what can you do to join the bite-sized revolution? And here is your mission, should you choose to accept it. The first is, um, think about how you can develop a, a value proposal for a bite-size approach for a specific issue or program that you might be dissatisfied with. I showed the illustrative value proposal earlier on, which, which demonstrated the fact you can get double the ROI of a traditional approach. Think about how you can actually develop that value proposition for one of your own um, issues. Second thing is identify where people are dissatisfied or want something different, um, connect with them, and then effectively start to create a groundswell of change within the organization so that the adoption of a bite-size approach Approach starts to become the norm. And then the final thing, at you, one of our core beliefs is the fact that science is sexy. So we would really, really encourage you to actually experiment with a bite-sized approach compared to the traditional approach. Of the two, do the measures, which works better, and then think about how you can uh, deploy the one that works better. Of course, I would be confident to say that I, I believe that the bite-sized approach will actually deliver more value for you. So with that, we're at our 30-minute mark. Um, my name is Sebastian Bailey. Um, thank you so much for taking part. Um, I'm on Twitter, and I do post and blog on these sorts of issues very regularly. So if you'd like to, to follow me or message me, then my Twitter handle is at Dr. Seb Bailey. But other than that, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have an excellent day. Thank you, and goodbye.